and uh, let's do a quick recap of what happened last week. So the first thing we did was uh, to talk about dynamic mechanisms uh, and asymptotic inefficiencies that arise in dynamic mechanisms. And this was a juxtaposition. This was to juxtapose the result from the week before, where we got that you know all mechanisms get you asymptotic efficiency if you can provide contemporaneous um, incentives. And so there are two main takeaways that I would like you to uh, bring home from this discussion. First of all, the whole approach to our to solution of those models that we talked about, where you had no way to provide contemporaneous incentives. So you either had only allocation to choose in a given period or only transfers to choose in a given period. So you could not use one to manipulate another or to induce the desirable other thing. You could not manipulate the allocation to get more transfers for yourself. You could not manipulate transfers to induce the desired allocation. But the thing is, uh, in dynamics, in dynamic settings, you can use uh, future promises or promises of future utility to provide incentives. So this was the main, this was the first takeaway. This is just to give you another tool. We do not have any examples where you could learn how to use that tool. Maybe I'll, I'll um, think of some and just give you another tiny set of problems, one or two at some later point, so that you can actually practice using this tool. Uh, but this was one main takeaway. Another main takeaway was uh, a cautionary tale for why you should probably not want to use it uh, as actively. Which is, if you do this, if you use this tool, uh, asymptotic inefficiencies uh, arise. And we get those weird and funky looking results like polarization, immiseration, uh, yeah, all kinds of things that you would not really expect to see in a, opt in a mechanism that's optimal in any way. But this does follow basically from, from this uh, tool. This is how basically it works. It, it's in its nature, you can say. So this was the big first part of last lecture. Uh, and are there any, any questions on that, maybe? The question is, why does one cause the other? So basically, what is the key idea behind this insight? And we did not talk that much about it. I only gave you this uh, one a quick intuition behind how it works in one particular model in, that, in the second one with the, with the graph of the branching utilities. And uh, so I do not have a prepared answer for that. But the on-the-spot answer would be that if you have any kind of bounds of what kind of utility you can provide. So if you cannot always, if, if you cannot always provide variation in, in future promises to provide incentives, then things break down at some point. And what I mean is you want to say, if you do this thing that is kind of good for me, good for the principal, then I will promise you good utility in the future. If you do this other thing that is good for you, but not good for the mechanism, for, for my principal's objective, then I will give you a bad promise. So you need to have this variation in, in promises to provide incentives. But if the, 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 the spectrum of utilities that you can promise is bounded at some point, so you cannot uh, put the agent at minus infinity or plus infinity, uh, that's usually the way it works in the real world. There are some constraints that um, preclude us from doing so, like maybe budget balance that uh, do not allow us to give the world to the agent, or agents limited liability, which say that agents can actually quit at any point, and we cannot put them at minus infinity. So if you have any kind of constraints like that, then eventually your promises will hit one of those bounds. And once you hit one of those bounds, you no longer have variation in, in future promises. I know this is a lot of hand waving with intervals and such, but this is the big idea. 
this is not, I think, the point that is very often recognized in, in classical mechanism design, because that's more or less new stuff. Right? Two of the papers that I've shown you were from the past five years. So it's not yet in the textbooks, but I think it will be soon, or eventually. Let's move on to the topic of, to the second topic that we covered last week and that we are continuing this week, which was matching models. And this is a class of models, which once again is very popular in economics, not typically a part of mechanism design, but as we, and maybe from the last week, from the last week's lecture, you did not really see what, why we're covering those. It's not super relevant. But today we'll bring it even closer to mechanism design, we'll bring it even closer to uh, what we were doing in the rest of the course. But broadly speaking, it was just a specific set of settings or environments uh, where we just have two sets of agents and we want to match them together. And this is probably a nice change from just our usual environments where we decide whom to give the item or decide which decision to implement. Although, you can see it as essentially the same thing, really. It's not that much different. But yeah, we have a bunch of agents on maybe two sides of the market, and we decide how to match them. So it's, it's like one of those puzzles in uh, kids, kids' books. And what did, we, what did we learn last week about these models, about matching models? What are, were the main takeaways about them? So we mostly look at the setting which resembled the social choice, um, the social choice theory problem. So if we say that this is the designer, so this is the designer, these are the players, and let me use some different color which will not look that different on Zoom, to say that this is the information set. So we looked at a model like this, and what I mean by this is our designer knew the same thing as all of the players, and all players knew all the same things. So everyone knew everyone's preferences, and we were trying to figure out how can we induce the best matching uh, in this setting, and what even is the best matching. And so we came up with the definition of the kind of equilibrium definition for matchings, which is stability. We want matches to be stable, meaning players would not have any incentive to rematch on their own. And we, we have an algorithm of how to find a st stable matching, which is the deferred acceptance algorithm. And it can give you up to two stable matches. And then we also talked about, uh, about this set of stable matches. So basically, how many stable matches there are, what can we say about uh, the space of solutions to this problem. And we saw that actually this set of solutions has a very nice structure. So deferred acceptance gives you kind of endpoints, and uh, one side of the market has aligned preferences within itself. So all agents on this market have the same kind of preferences across stable matchings, and these preferences are exactly opposed to the preferences of the other side. So that was really a lot of results, a lot of results that I mentioned, and some of those we, we even proved. So then we started you know, taking small steps towards, um, towards our more standard problem, which is we have the agents and we're, we, the designer, are trying to design the game that they are playing. So first of all, in this kind of model, where the designer knows everybody's preferences. How would you say, what would be the, the mechanism that induces the desired stable matching? In the model we looked, we already know players' preferences. So we know what exactly the matching will be, right? So we can even skip this step of extracting players' preferences and directly say that the allocation we implement, the matching we implement, is this one. This is the one we like. So we basically issue a law which says this person should be matched to them, this person to them, or this firm should be matched to the factory, you know, the way it worked in Soviet Union, more or less. 
So this is what happens if the designer thinks, at least, that they know player's preferences. Then, the probably very last thing we did last week was to consider a model like this, where there are two different information sets. So let's call this version 1. And the previous one was version 0. Thank you. So look at the graph and tell me what, what this model actually is. Who knows what? Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. So all players know each other's types. They are all in this common information bubble. While the designer is outside of that bubble. So the designer does not have this knowledge. The designer has their own knowledge, which is no knowledge at all. So the designer does not know what other player's preferences are. Right? And so we said that, well, in the classical matching theory, maybe uh, that theory tells us that there is no actual good matching mechanism or no good game that would be dominant strategy instead of compatible for all players. And we gave a small example to show why that, why, why that would be. And this example would have worked for all, basically, for any mechanism you can come up with, so that example would break it. So in that example, there would be a profitable deviation for at least some player uh, for, for that given preference profile. So we did that. We showed that in this case, there is no good solution. And the other thing was we argued once we realized that this is actually the model we are looking at, that it looks like this. We said that, well, we, we kind of already seen this model before, and we have a good mechanism to work with that. We do know how to solve this problem, so long as we have some kind of a nuclear, nuclear, nuclear option, not nuclear, nuclear option, right? So if we can find all players uh, with a large sum of money, or if we can select an allocation that is equally bad for all players, and we know none of them would like it, then we can induce truth telling by asking all players to report their preference profiles, all players' preference profiles. And as, as long as reports coincide, we take that as truth. If reports diverge, we punish everybody. So this is the model with which we ended up last time, where we ended up. And we said that, well, it's not really the model we care about. We do not, it's not the interesting case when all players know everybody's preferences. Maybe through gossip, yes. Maybe through industrial uh, espionage, when we are talking about firms and resources and inputs and outputs, maybe. But we are more interested in actually the case where every player has private information, where that player's actual preferences are only known to them. So we want to look at version two of the incomplete information model or asymmetric information model. And which information sets look like this? Every player has their own information set. They know their own preferences. The designer is not in the same bubble as anyone else. So the designer might have some prior belief about the distribution of players' preferences, but the designer does not know for sure what the preferences are. So let us right now look at this model and ask the question that we are asking in, in, in this setting. Can we design a mechanism that would be incentive compatible for all players? Let's say dominant strategy incentive compatible, or at least Bayesian, we don't really care. And this mechanism would be such that we would implement a stable matching given all players' reports. So that is the reason why we are learning, why, why we are trying to learn player preferences, because we want to implement a stable matching. So this was the introduction to what uh, I just said. Last big bullet point actually makes a good point that we we'll probably want to talk about. So I said that we are looking for a dominant strategy incentive compatible or, or a Bayesian mechanism for this version 2 model. 
where players only know their preferences privately. So let's let's tackle these two separately. Let's first ask, can we find a domain strategy in semi compatible mechanism? And the answer is no, because we already know how it works, uh, because we already saw that it, that it wouldn't work. Why is that? So what this slide attempts to say is that dominant strategy in semi compatibility has this interpretation in which players can kind of change their report after learning everybody else's types or reports. So in equilibrium, we think that all other players report truthfully. So uh, every single agent as it kind of knows everybody else's true types, right? So with domain strategy and ZNF compatibility, we kind of think that it should be optimal for our uh, player to learn uh, everybody else's types and then say, okay, yeah, I stand by my report. This is who I actually am. I confirm that. Meaning that it should be optimal for players to report the truth once they are in this common information bubble once they know everybody, uh, each other's preferences. And we already have a counterexample for that. We saw that there is no mechanism, no matching protocol that would be incentive compatible in this, in this sense, if all players know everybody else's preferences. So the conclusion is, we cannot find any dominant strategy incentive compatible mechanism for this version 2 model. Let's move on to the second part of the question and ask, is there a Bayesian mechanism that would work for this study? So here we cannot reduce it to our version 1 model. We cannot frame it in a way in which uh, everybody else knows everybody else's preferences because in Bayesian mechanisms, it must be optimal to report the truth only at the point at which the player is still unsure of everybody else's preferences at which the player is still has some belief about the profile of everybody else's preferences, right? But then we can actually adapt our counterexample slightly and arrive to the same negative conclusion. And this slide basically describes this version 2 model uh, in, in a slightly more formal way. So to describe our environment, we say that we have players, they have some types, they report the types to the mechanism, these types determine players' preferences, and so on. So the usual thing, right? Just to make sure that we, that we are all on the same page here. And what, yeah, one thing that we need to say is, is stability a meaningful concept still in this, in this context? What does stability mean? Stability means that all players basically know everybody else's types, right? So we are now, by requiring stability, implicitly thinking about a world, about a mechanism in which players start like this, they report something to the mechanism, and then once we are done, once the matching is set in stone, and put in law or an executive order, then all the reports are revealed or all the types are revealed. So we, we do not just announce the matching, we announce all players' reports. And then there should be no blocking pairs in that announced, according to that announced uh, reference profile. So this theorem, what does it tell us? Uh, it says that there is well, it says what it says, but what it effectively says, what it actually says, is that in this incomplete information model, that can really draw like this, uh, there is no Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism that implements a stable matching. This is the phrasing that I maybe should have used, but this is the phrasing that's closer to uh, the way it's originally stated. The, there is just a small technical assumption here that we should have at least two players on each side of the market because otherwise the problem trivializes to some extent. If we have only one player, then we can ask that player to report their preferences and we just can work on those. So in that case, we do not need to know two other players' preferences. And in that case, it would indeed be the case that there will be some stable matching in which 
that uh, one person is is basically the dictator. So you can see this as an analog of the arrows theorem or Jabbar Satterthwaite theorem that we saw. That uh, dictatorship is the only incentive compatible mechanism. But here we kind of already make the technical assumption that rules out dictatorship. And once we rule that out, there are no mechanisms left. So why is that? It's interesting for us to know. Well, we are already said that there is no mechanism we can use, but we would like to at least know why. Why is that? Uh, so the thing is, we can use the same example we had before. OK, I'll, I'll leave it here, but I'll also put it on the board. So you can think of this example as follows, or you can reinterpret this example as follows. Probably don't, you don't need to read the slides. It's just there as a reference. But you have these, uh, this two by two market. So two men, two women, they all have the same preferences as before. So no, not quite. Everything in, in its term. So we have M1, M2, W1, W2. And they can have, some of them have different types. Okay, don't look at the slides. So M1 and W1 just have a single type, which means that we as the designer know their preferences and all other players also know their preferences for sure. And these preferences will be, yeah, M1 prefers W1, W2 to M1, W1 prefers M2 to M1 to W1. So these are their single types. Now for M2 and W2, we'll say that they have two types each. Uh, let's call them say it, uh, M A, theta M B, theta W A, theta W B. So they both have an A type and a B type. But the preferences will be kind of similar across the two. So for M2, let's say uh, his A type prefers woman 2 to woman 1 to uh, solitude. And type B prefers W2 to solitude to W1. So the whole heterogeneity, the whole difference between the two types is how much does M2 not like uh, W1? So what's the relation between W1 and staying alone? And the same for a woman too. So her type A does not like being alone. She prefers M1 to M2 to W2. And her type B says, you know, either I'm matched perfectly or I stay alone. But I do not really like this dude. M2. And the distribution actually of them is such that um, these B types are very unlike that they happen with some probability epsilon. And as probability 1 minus epsilon, the A types are the thing. So our players are likely not strong and independent. They really want to get matched. What is our goal, first of all? What did we want to do? Uh, our initial goal was to find a Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism for V2 model. So the one we have here, where the standard mechanism design version of the matching problem, where everyone only knows their own preferences. Uh, but that implements the stable matching. This was our goal to start with. And the claim is such a mechanism does not exist. And what we're doing now is effectively proving this claim. In particular, the way we are proving it is by constructing this counterexample. So to prove that no mechanism is universal, we just need to find some profile of preferences under which this mechanism breaks down, under which this mechanism is either not Bayesian incentive compatible, or it would have to implement something that is not stable. It would have to select something that is not stable. 
And this is then the example that we constructed. So two by two uh, marriage market where, where two of the players have two types, two other players have single types. Cool. So what is our next step? We want to see that whatever your mechanism does, in this example, it will break down. How do we show that? To show that, we need to analyze this example more clearly. What you can find by analyzing this example slightly more carefully is that there are only three matches that would ever be stable for our four possible type profiles. So I will prepare ourselves by writing stable matchings. And what our mechanism should do is for any profile reports of our two players with non-trivial types, our mechanism should select some matching and we want it to be stable. So we have four basic cases. We have a case where M2 is of type A and W is of type A. We have a case where M is of type B and W is of type A. Oof, this is going to get real small. We got a case where M is of type A and W is of type B. Bless you. And finally, we have a case where M is of type B and W is of type B as well. So we have four cases. And you, what you would do if you are solving this problem on your own is you would just go case by case and say that, well, in this case, I run deferred acceptance in my head. And so what is the stable matching there? Then in the second case, what is the stable match in there? Or what is the set of stable matches? This is actually a, a more difficult problem. But with two by two case, you can just run deferred acceptance both ways, and you will find both stable matches because there are at most two. I think this statement is correct. But there are, there are basically three uh, candidates that we can have overall. Let's call them mu1, mu2, mu3. mu1 says that uh, mu1 is the men preferred deferred acceptance matching uh, under AA, so m1 and w1. m2, w2. mu2 is the women preferred stable matching under profile of types AA, so M1, W2, M2, W1. And these are the machines that we worked with last time around. And now, just, I realize it's not particularly interesting just following me solving a problem on the board, so I'll ask you to solve at least, you know, just this tiny part of it. Find me a stable match in U3. And I'll give you a hint. You need to look at this last case for that. Suppose both agents are B-types. Run deferred acceptance and find me a stable matching. Go. That's right. So let's write it like this. M1 and woman 1 stay together. Man 1, man 2 stays with man 2. Woman 2 stays with woman 2. Yes, you could have written as just as M2 and W2. Doesn't really matter. So these are the three possible stable machines in this problem, which you have no way of knowing really, but uh, I, I solved the problem for you, and the textbook solved this problem for you, and so I'm telling you we'll always have a few of some combination of these three in this table. So we already know that mu3 is the stable one in this last case. So mu3, and I apologize again, it is very small. Would any of the other two be stable in this bb case? Exactly. So either man2 or woman2 would break uh, these two respective matchings under a bb type profile. 
because they would rather be single than be with their prescribed match. That's exactly right. So in this case, our mu3 is the only uh, stable match. Now, AA is another case that we already know the answer to, because this is the example we saw last time around. And we saw that in this, in this case, mu1 and mu2 are the two stable matchings that are the two matches that are stable. Okay, now another question to you. What are, what matchings are stable in these two remaining cases? You can see they are kind of symmetric, so probably you only need to solve one of them. But tell me, so let's look at this case where uh, the type of uh, is theta mb and theta wa. Which of the three, these three machines will be stable in this case? U1 seems like it would work under this type profile. And then can you find the blocking pairs for the other two? So let's say if we have mu2, what is the blocking pair then? Man2 would rather be single. That's exactly right. Man 2 really doesn't like woman 1 in that case. And if we talk about mu3, what would be the blocking pair then? Exactly. So man 2 and woman 2 would like to match up. So they would like to deviate from this matching that prescribes that they are single. And we consider that a blocking pair as well. So mu1 is the only stable matching in this second case. And in the third case, by analogy, we infer that mu2 is the only matching that would be stable damaged. What we did is we found uh, the stable matchings that our mechanism would need to select among. Basically, we want to find such, such a mechanism where every player reports their type, and our mechanism then says, well, it's either mu1 or mu2 or mu3. That's it. So the only kind of non-trivial choice that we have is which matching should be selected in, in this first case, mu1 or mu2. Let's just pick one of them. You can guess that the problem is symmetric, so it does not really matter. Suppose that our mechanism uh, selects mu1 uh, in case 1, I mean this case. So the whole point of that is that then one of the players would have a profitable deviation. Basically, we only have two players. They each have one deviation possible. So either our man 2 will report their type as B or our woman 2 will report their type as B. And let's see. So if our man misreports the, his type, then instead of matching mu1 that our mechanism selects, uh, another machine will be chosen, which is mu1. So not actually another machine. That's the only machine that is stable in this case. So man2 does not have any incentives to misreport. And what about woman2? Let's look at what she can do. So if she reports truthfully, then our mechanism selects mu1, under which she is matched with m2. If she misreports her type is theta wb, then the mechanism selects the mechanism that is stable if our man is of type A and our woman's type B, which is mu2. So by misreporting, w2 can switch the matching chosen by the mechanism from mu1 to mu2. So she can switch her match from m2 to m1. She prefers that. So this mechanism would not be incentive compatible for woman 2. And you can make the sim this similar, the mirror argument or the opposite if our mechanism selects mu2 in case 1. So this densely packed piece of board shows you 
that whatever mechanism you try to choose, you, it can never be incentive compatible and applicable to all preference profiles. So if it includes this example, it will not be incentive compatible. And select a stable mechanism for every uh, type profile. So these three properties cannot be satisfied simultaneously. This was the big takeaway. Now we can return to the slides, and this is actually the slide right after the, the example I did. So we have our negative result. This is a, the proof of our negative result. And this negative result is of our usual kind, right? That there is no mechanism that works. What do we do with these kind of results? First, we cry a little in the corner. Then we say, maybe our requirements were too strong. Maybe our goal was unrealistic. So we should temper our expectations. We should set more reasonable goals. What can we relax here? So basically, we have three main parts here. First, we want our mechanism to be Bayesian incentive compatible. We work in the framework of this model version 2. Let's say so the standard mechanism design model. And we're implementing the stable matching. These are the three things that we can relax. Bayesian incentive compatibility is already the relaxed version of incentive compatibility as compared to domain strategy incentive compatibility. So we don't want to relax that any further because that is the minimal that we want. Model version 2 is kind of the model that we look at always. So we also want to have this uniformity. We want to maintain this uniformity. We want to look at model version 2. But let's look closer and take this uh, philosophical look at the concept of stability and ask, is this something we actually want? It made sense in the original model that we started with. So this version 0, where everybody knew everything. This was kind of the equilibrium. We could think of that as an equilibrium. But now, is it still an appropriate equilibrium concept? And we started with exactly that, uh, with discussing the concept of stability. We said that here it has this unreasonable interpretation in which it's as if everybody gets to learn everybody's reports or everybody's true types after the mechanism is run. And they can kind of form the blocking pair. But thing is, uh, we can think of this requirement as holding even if true types are not announced. Even if uh, true types are not announced, but for example, the cost of making an offer to somebody else is low, so you can attempt to form a blocking pair and you just send out a thousand spam letters. Would you like to form a blocking pair with me? Right? Somebody might agree. So this way you can learn the... It's a valid Tinder strategy, right? That's how it works, I think. That's the intended Tinder strategy. Um, then you might form a blocking pair. So maybe you do not need to learn... The me maybe the mechanism does not need to announce the profile of types for stability to be a relevant concept. But what if we actually are thinking of designing a mechanism that does not announce reports after it is run because why would it we think of the mechanism that only announces the matching that was realized and then the cost of even offering to form a blocking pair is large enough meaning that the spam option is not an option you need to actually invite somebody out on a date you have to call them you have to pay for the phone that's that's really expensive but you have to pay for the date you have to pay for the dinner so any such offer is really expensive. Then you only want to make that offer if you are reasonably sure that that other person is willing to form a matching pair, uh, blocking pair with you. But then how do you base your inference on whether that blocking pair is, would be realized? So if you can only infer something from observing the final matching, and this is the realized matching is the only thing you know in addition to the prior distributions. So these two things are the only thing you know, the only things you know about other players' preferences. Then maybe we can develop the concept that is weaker than stability. 
So we do not need stability with respect to true types, but we need stability in, in this in expectation in a sense. And this is what I called version three of the model. The actual model is the, the same as before. So all players know their own preferences and that's it. The difference between version two and version three is what happens afterwards. So in version three, only information about matching is re revealed after the mechanism is run. In version two, we also revealed basically all, uh, all reports. And I just wanted to briefly very tell you about a couple of papers that tried this, that try to develop an appropriate stability concept for these settings. And uh, so there are these two. But it's, I wrote it in a very correctly, that it's not very pleasant to work with. What it actually means, as you can guess, is it's extremely painful to work with. So these inference problems are extremely complicated. And on the one hand, this means that we, you do not really want to be solving them unless you really have to, unless you really think that this is the right thing to do. And secondly, the fact that these inference problems are so complicated also means that you probably do not believe that real world agents are solving those problems. So maybe, maybe there is something else to be done there. But this is just an announcement that there is a literature that does that. I will not tell you anything about it because I know nothing about it. It's too smart for me. But you can look at it if you want. This concludes our discussion of incomplete information models of matching. So we talked about different models of different ways in which we can Im incorporate incomplete information into matching. And we saw that most of the time there are no uh, positive results. So there are no mechanisms we can use for all settings. And I guess, yeah, I have a summary here. But the bottom line here is incomplete information matching models are a story of failure, which kind of contrasts with matching models in general being a story of huge success. So incomplete information really, really broke things here. <laughs>